We have. Hello, boa tarde. Sejam todos bem-vindos. Good afternoon. É um prazer estar com todos aqui. Estamos recebendo pessoas de todo o Brasil que se inscreveram para participar dessa sessão da Purdue University é, School of Engineering, nível de, de pós-graduação, mestrado e doutorado. Nós estamos aqui com três representantes da universidade, com a Heidi Arola, a Jackie McDermott e o Lexi Ramsey, e eles vão se apresentar individualmente para vocês. Uh, eu sou a Anelise Zandona Hoffman, Country Coordinator do Education USA. Nós temos 43 escritórios pelo Brasil. O Education USA é a fonte oficial sobre todos os Estados Unidos. Somos afiliados ao Departamento do Estado americano. E a nossa missão é oferecer informações sobre todas as instituições americanas em nível superior, é, informações atualizadas, é, todas é, que os alunos possam ter da maneira mais direta com as próprias instituições e recebam todas as é, informações que eles precisam para se candidatar para uma faculdade, mestrado ou doutorado. Nossos orientadores são qualificados para atender vocês. Assim como a gente tem hoje aqui os alunos do Oportunidades Acadêmicas, que é o programa também do Departamento do Estado de Pan, que apoia alunos de vários lugares do Brasil nas suas candidaturas de mestrado e doutorado. Então, hoje, sobre engenharia, não somente engenharia, mas também sobre a Universidade de Purdue e como funciona o processo de candidatura. É, a sessão vai ser em inglês, eu vou passar a palavra para os nossos visitantes. E depois vamos ter uma fase de perguntas e respostas. Fiquem à vontade para mandar no chat, a gente vai ajudando, tá? Ok, so welcome everyone. This is wonderful to have such a good audience this afternoon. Happy Friday. So I want to welcome our colleagues from Purdue University. And we'll have this special session on graduate programs from with the uh, School of Engineering at this wonderful institution. So I'll pass the floor to Alexia Renzi and to Jackie McDermott and Heidi Arola to introduce themselves and take the time to talk to you. Have a great session. Thank you, Lexi. Hi, everyone. I'm Lexi Arinze. Um, I work with the College of Engineering and I'm a grad student here. So I'll let Jackie and Heidi introduce themselves. Hi, it's so nice to meet everyone. Um, I work in our Office of Graduate Education here at Purdue Engineering, um, and I'm really, again, excited to meet all of you. And I'll kick it over to Heidi. Boa tarde a todos e a todas. O meu nome é Heidi Arola. Eu sou a diretora de parcerias globais na Universidade de Purdue. Eu já estou aqui há sete anos. E um, mais, eu era diplomata antes, eu morava no Brasil durante quase seis anos, e eu também era chefe de Education USA em Washington, D.C. Então é um prazer estar com vocês, e no final eu posso um, responder a perguntas também, um, se alguém gostaria de perguntar em português. Sim, yeah, awesome. <laughs> I definitely want to learn how to speak that. <laughs> But... So um, without wasting further time, I think I'll just share my screen and start my presentation proper. Um, yeah, I need to confirm if everyone can see my screen okay. Awesome. Yeah, so um, like I said earlier, my name is Lexi Arinze. I'm a graduate research assistant with the College of Engineering. And today I'll be talking about um, graduate study uh, with Purdue University. During this presentation, I'll be talking about Purdue University, um, what is like at Purdue University, the campuses we have, and then I'll talk about the College of Engineering itself, um, how to apply to College of Engineering, what kind of programs we have, um, the facilities we have, and things like that. And then I'll talk about um, the kind of collaboration we already have with Purdue uh, with Brazil and what that is like. And then I'll talk about the graduate school degrees we have, what you can get out of um, graduate school, be it a master's degree or a PhD. 
and then I'll talk about funding because we know graduate school isn't cheap, right? So I'll talk about how you can get funding and tips on um, the application process. So stick with me. I hope this is fun for you. <laughs> right. So um, I'll start with talking about myself, right? Like I said, I am a graduate research assistant with the Graduate Office of the College of Engineering. And I'm also currently doing my master's in civil engineering at Purdue University. So how did I get here? I had my bachelor's degree in civil engineering at the University of Ibadan, Nigeria. I also went for a student exchange program in the Universidad de Jaén in Spain for a period of five months. My Spanish is rusty. I didn't get to learn it properly, but yeah, <laughs> this experience made me and um, gave me an idea what it is like to study outside my country. And it made me strengthen my reserve to go into grad school because I knew I wanted to learn more and do more research and be a part of something bigger. Right. So I started thinking about applying to graduate school. Then I found Education USA, the Nigerian branch. Um, I was a member of Education USA Lagos. So I attended the boot camps. I learned about um, graduate school applications, talking to um, faculty, things like that, and what I needed to do to apply to grad school. And then I applied to grad school. Then I got Purdue University. So why did I choose Purdue University? I chose Purdue University for a number of reasons. One of them is the fact that it is a top R1 institution. That is, it's involved in a lot of high impact research. And then because my program, which is civil engineering, is well ranked in the United States. Also, there were faculty involved in the type of research I wanted to be doing. Finally, it was because of the growing community of Nigerian students, because I wanted to be where I had other Nigerians like myself. I didn't want to feel isolated in the university. And one thing you should know about Purdue University is that it is big on diversity. The international student community is kind of large and it's still growing. Even the Brazil um, student network is also growing as well. So that is one thing you should know about Purdue University. Enough about myself. So let's talk about um, Purdue University itself. So Purdue University is located in uh, the Midwestern United States. It is not so far from um, Chicago. So I did a little research on trying to figure out the distance between Purdue as Indianapolis and some cities in um, Brazil. So for my research, I found out that Sao Paulo is about 10 hours, 36 minutes flight from um, Indianapolis. So if you're thinking about coming to Purdue, you should know you should you would be in the air for about 10 hours, 36 minutes. Yeah. So that's something you should think about. So it's not so far. So you can make it. Right. So a little more about Purdue University. Uh, we have about four campuses at Purdue University. Uh, three of them are regional campuses, and there is a main campus. The regional campuses include the Purdue University Port of Fort Wayne, the Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis, and the Purdue Northwest um, at close to Chicago Northwestern region of Indiana. So these three university um, campuses are the regional campuses, and Purdue offers over 80 programs through these regional campuses. And then there is the main and oldest campus at the West Lafayette campus. That is where I am presenting from. So a major difference between the main campus and the three other regional campuses is the fact that the main campus is PH is the PhD hub. So if you're thinking about doing a PhD, you should be applying to the West Lafayette campus, right? And that's where most of the research is being done. When you decide to apply to Purdue University, you get the chance of um, choosing up to three campuses in your application and programs uh, with one single application and application fee. That sounds really cool. So you get three packages in one with one single application. So you're choosing West Lafayette campus. What's so special about the West Lafayette campus? Yeah, I'll give you more details about it as we go on. So. Um, the West Lafayette campus has a number of colleges, which you can see as I'm presenting, right? Um, each college has a number of programs uh, it offers. Like I'm from the College of Engineering and there are a number of programs under College of Engineering. So there's all these other programs as you can see. So, but today my focus will be in the College of Engineering. 
and I'll give you more details as we go on. So Purdue University has over 49,000 students, that's a lot, right? And 37,000 of them are undergrads, 12,000 are grad students. We are ranked as the third public school in the United States. So that's a high ranking. And when it comes to the engineering program, we have the largest engineering program in the top 10 universities in the United States. We have a lot of laboratories. One third of the graduate student population in Purdue uh, are engineering grad students. This is no, um, this is because we have one of the standard programs. We have a number of research facilities and programs that build some of the best engineering grad students. Our alumni is actually, our alumni actually do great things, right? Uh, we boast of the fact that um, the first and most recent humans on the moon were products of Purdue University. So if you get out of Purdue University, you're certain you're going to do something great. Right, you're going to be among the stars, right? We we have over 24 NASA um, astronauts graduated from Purdue University, and whenever there is a space from shuttle flight, you can be rest assured that at least one person is a product of Purdue University. So that is one of the amazing things about our program. Talking more about um our College of Engineering. We have about 14 schools. So if you're thinking about the College of Engineering, you program you're interested in, you're probably going to find something close to it if you don't find exactly the program you want. So we have 14 schools. We have aeronautics and astronautics, biomedical engineering. All those programs can be found on our program's website. Um, this will be posted in the, in the chat so you can check it out during the presentation. So yeah, I talked about the fact that we have exciting programs. What are some of the other things that you should look out for if you are planning to come to Purdue? It's the research facilities. We have amazing research facilities at Purdue University. One of them is the Bowen Laboratory for Large-Scale Civil Engineering Research. It is about 66,000 um, square feet in area. And um, only five other facilities like this exist exist in the United States. And none is as modern as the Bowen Laboratory. So if you're thinking about large-scale research um, in civil engineering, we've got you covered. We have that in Purdue. And we also have the Burke Nanotechnology Center. This is um, easily the largest clean room in the world, right? So you can do a lot of research that require clean rooms in Purdue University. This is the place where you find that happening. And then we have the Zucro's, Zucro Laboratory. This is the largest academic proportion laboratory in the world. <laughs> I keep mentioning largest in the world, largest in the world. Yes, it's because we have one of the best in the world around here. So if you're coming, you're coming to one of the best institutions in the United States. We also have the Eric's Laboratory. This, this is the laboratory for mechanical engineering. Anything mechanical you're going to find is in this laboratory. So. I've talked about the facilities. Beyond facilities, we have our um, Purdue universities. One other thing we should look out for is the fact that we're big on international enrollment, right? Um, Purdue University is easily one of the top 10 for international enrollment. It is number nine out of 4,500 plus US institution in terms of international student enrollment. And approximately 9,000 international students are Purdue. And they're from 130 different countries around the world. That's according to the 2021 fall statistics, right? And we also have over 1,000 international faculty. So our faculties aren't just Americans. They're from all across the world, over 70 nations. In terms of engineering, we have over 3,645 students, which are, who are international students. And then narrowing it down to the Brazilian population, Easily, well, Brazil is the sixth largest populated um, international um, students in Purdue University. So we have 140 students, 148 students, and 101 undergrads, 47 grad students. We have 44 visiting scholars, faculties, and researchers from Brazil itself. So it is the number one US institution for international environments in STEM. So if you're thinking about coming to the US, you're not going to be alone because you're going to be around family, 
it's like family away from family, right? A little more about um, Purdue University and Brazil. One second, yeah. About Purdue University and Brazil, we've had an history of collaboration with um, Purdue University that stems since the 1950s. So uh, we're not strangers to having um, Brazil students at Purdue uh, or having relations with Brazil. Um, uh, we have ID Arula here has more information about this. She's skilled in this area, so she's going to give you more information if you have any inquiries about it. And um, about the full bike share um, the memorandum, this was signed uh, in 2019, right? Um, that, that has been happening for a bit. The last call closed already, probably next year it will be open again. And then we also have the KPs, um, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that correctly, but Heidi can do that later, right? Yeah, KP's Purdue Agricultural PhD Fellows Program. This was also um, signed in 2019. The idea of this is to um, fund 10 um, Brazilian students to Purdue for their doctoral degrees for a period of five years. The first three years is to be covered by um, the Brazilian higher education, while the last two is to be covered by um, Purdue University. So you're basically being funded throughout your PhD program at Purdue University, and it is open for any fields in agriculture, right? So agriculture, engineering, agriculture and biological engineering is part of it. And one thing you should know is that our agriculture and biological engineering is the first, is ranked first as the first graduate program in the United States, according to the US News. So if you're coming, you should be expected to apply to this. The call is expected to be open next week, right? So if you have any question regarding this, um, feel free to ask us about it after the presentation. Going on, so um, I've talked about um, Purdue University, graduate school and stuff like that. So why should you even come to the United States in the first place? This is easy because half of the world's top 20 universities are in the United States. We boast of the best research facilities around the world. And you get to meet different people from different walks of life. I like to think of the United States as the melting point of different cultures. You get to meet people from different parts of the world. Like currently, I have friends from... Um, from Iran, friends from um, China, from, from India, all over the world, and they're doing research together in a university. So that's something you should think about, the diversity from people bringing different knowledge together and sharing ideas. And then there's a strong research culture and infrastructure. You have access to the world's leading publications and funding opportunity. The, lending, the, the, the list is endless. There's the, no limits of the things you tend to achieve while coming to the United States. So why go to the um, graduate school in the first place? So if you think you're passionate about um, learning or doing research, then grad school might be the next thing for you. Uh, if you're thinking about becoming an expat, you want to gain new knowledge, or you want to become a professional, you want to be well grounded in your chosen area of specialization, or you want to enhance your career, then definitely you should be thinking about graduate school. Then if you're coming to graduate school, what do you think you're going to get out of it? You can either get a master's degree or a PhD. For a master's degree, um, the difference between a master degree, master's and a PhD degree come, uh, are a number of things. First is the credits. Um, for a master's degree, you need 30 to 33 credits to graduate. While a PhD, you need 90 credits to graduate. Um, the 30 can stem from your master's degree, right? There are two ways to get your PhD. You can either get it directly through a direct PhD. When you're in your undergrad, you apply directly for a PhD and you get your PhD at the end of the day. Or you get your master's first and then you go into your PhD. That's where you transfer credits from master's to PhD. For a master's degree, it could be two options. You could have a thesis-based master's or a non-thesis-based master's. For a thesis-based master's, you get to do research as well as coursework. But for non-thesis, you don't get to do any thesis. You don't get to write any research or things like that. You just do your courses only and you graduate. But for a PhD, you get to do research because it is research intensive. So you do a lot of research and you do coursework. And at the end of your program, you'd write a dissertation which you have to defend in order to graduate. 
for your master's degree, it takes roughly between one to three years, while a PhD takes between three to seven years. So if you get a master's degree, you want to use it to um, get some specialization in your career or regulatory services, or you can work in industry. But if you get a PhD, you get a career in research, you can work in industry, you can work as a professor, you can work in academic administration. Think of a PhD as a license to think you can do anything, the world is your oyster. There's a wrong notion that once you get a PhD, you definitely have to be a professor. This is, this is actually wrong. You don't need to be in academia because you have a PhD. If you get a PhD, you can work in academia, you can be a professor, you can go to industry, whatever you want to do, think of it as being able to do it. So um, like I said earlier, um, Getting a graduate degree isn't a cake work. You, it's, it requires a lot of money and then you can get funded. Yeah. There are different ways to get funding at Purdue University. Purdue University boosts the funding 70% of the full-time graduate students. That's a lot. So how do you get funding at Purdue University? There are two ways. You can get via fellowship or assistantship. Fellowships are basically free money. You, you get paid to study. Um, it, it, could be, it could be internal or in external. When you mean internal, that means Purdue University is funding you with the fellowship, while external, it's an external organization or government agency is the one funding you. You may have to do some minor work or some other requirements as part of the fellowship requirement, but know that the fellowship is highly competitive. Not a lot of people get it, and it is... Um, because it is free, right? When you get free money, you have to do something remarkable to get it. So that's why it is highly competitive. For assistantships, you have to work on the side to get your um, funding. Assistantship come in the form of research, teaching, or administrative assistantship. So you get to work part-time and then you get paid to work. Your tuition is paid for, you get monthly or uh, bi-weekly stipends and you get your insurance um, sorted. So you get to do research while you get paid to do that. So who gets this funding? Um, funding has been ranked from based on priority. PhD students are going to be funded, considered for funding first. And then master's, professional master's students are not going to be, I mean, going to receive the least funding. So for a PhD student, you get considered for fellowships, research assistantships, teaching assistantships, and graduate assistantships. While if you're a master's student, you also get for, um, considered for similar funding if you're doing thesis. But if you're not doing thesis, you're not going to be considered for research assistantship because you're not doing anything for the university. You're not doing research for the um, university. So you're not going to be paid as a research assistant. The funding you get is either a TA, a GA, or an employer who you're working with pays for your schooling or you pay for yourself. I wouldn't recommend that. So you want, you want to get some funding if you're coming to grad school. Otherwise, it is not going to be worth it. So how does assistantship, um, the funding, how do they work? When you apply to Purdue University, your application automatically gets considered for funding, for some sort of funding, either um, your fellowships or assistantships. The moment you apply, you're considered for it. Uh, and um, fellowships are what you get considered first. And then if you do not qualify for assist fellowships, you get considered for assistantships. And if you do not get considered for that, you just get admitted without funding. And you should know that fellowships consideration are given to PhD students. So once you apply, if your application is for a PhD, you get apply and considered for a fellowship first before you are considered for assistantships or any other master students considered. So I've talked about fellowships. How do um, assistantships work? So for assistantships, the faculty or professor you wanna work with applies for um, sends grant proposals to government agencies, corporations or nonprofit organizations for funding. And when the, the proposals are granted, they get funded to re-research. They can't do this research alone. So they need assistance um, with this research. And that is where you come in. 
they now give you the research assistantship to help with the research and then you get paid because you're working and helping the um, faculty to do research. So that's how research assistantships and TEAs work. So for fellowships, uh, they could be internal or external, like I said earlier. Internal fellowships, you automatically get considered for it, while external fellowships, you have to apply outside your applications. Um, an example of an external fellowship is the KPIS, which I talked about earlier on. So you apply for that separately from your normal applications. Often this um, um, external fellowships are granted by governments, non-professional, non-profit agencies, um, professional organizations. And you should know that the requirements, benefits, um, durations, and el eligibility um, vary from fellowship to fellowship. What works for this fellowship is not the same for the other fellowship. So you need to read between the fine lines if you're thinking about applying for um, fellowships. And they may be full or partial. They might fund your entire um, period of study or a year or two. So you need to like understand how these fellowships work. And you may have to work or do some other requirements as part of your fellowships. So if you're thinking about starting um, next year, the best time to start working on your application is this year. So you need to start looking out for um, funding opportunities a year prior to the time you want to resume. So if you're thinking about resuming for the fall 2023, you need to start working now, finding out what programs you can apply to and how you can apply. For instance, I mentioned the KPIS earlier on, so definitely that is something you need to look out for and start working on as soon as you can. So how do you find funding opportunities? Yeah, it is not um, an easy task. It is a marathon. So you need to give yourself time to do this. First thing you need to do if you are applying to a particular program is to check the program's website. Check out, okay, what's, what's, what's about this program? How does funding work? Do I have to like reach out to faculty or um, does the program automatically offer me funding immediately I apply? So these are some things you need to check out. And if you have any inquiries regarding that program, you can always email the grad coordinator, which is usually found on the website. If you're required to like email faculty before your application submission, you need to mention the faculty in your application. That is in your statement of purpose. You need to mention that, okay, I am interested in applying to this program and I have this faculty I'm interested in working with because the research this person is doing is, I mean, ties to my interest and I want to be doing things like that. If you decide to reach out to the faculty, you need to keep your email short and straight to the point. You need to keep it professional and research focused and then attach your resume. Do not, do not for any reason send out your, um, your email and then uh, ask for funding immediately. That is like bad etiquette. Do not request, request for funding immediately as you send out your email. Just ask about um, your research work. Oh, um, I've read about your research on this website and Google Scholar. I found this exciting and I think it ties to my interest. I've been doing this, I've been doing that, and I like what you do. I wanna do what you're doing. How does this work? Do you have a minute to talk more? Things like that, but don't just go off the bat and say, okay, uh, do you have funding for me? That is wrong. Also attach your resume when you try to send out an email to inquire about funding opportunities. At Purdue University, we have some information about funding and fellowships if, you, if you're looking out for that. So um, this will be posted on the chats as well. So you can check it out. Um, we have a website where we have full information about fellowships, funding opportunities. You can check out, um, just check the link. And I think Jackie can help to send that on the chat, chat for you people to see. All right. Also, we have um, uh, a funding uh, video on YouTube. So check out our engineering graduate programs channel on YouTube. We have every um, video you can think about, about graduate school application, um, this presentation about um, funding, how you can go about it. There are a lot of videos there for you to check out. Just take a second to like, go through it and you'll be happy you, do, you did that. 
yeah, that is a little about it regarding funding. Now let's get to proper about the graduate application process itself. So unlike your undergraduate application, the um, the graduate school application is pretty decentralized in the sense that not just one one office is responsible for your application. It goes through a number of offices. First is the graduate um, Purdue University Graduate School. This manages your online application system. So when you apply to um, Purdue University Graduate School is the school that receives your application and it sends it to your individual pro programs. The individual core graduate program is the one that reviews your application and then makes decisions, sets the admission um, requirements and recommendations to, um, to the graduate school. So when they make the decision about your admission, they send it back to the graduate school. Um, the graduate school is the one that now sends your offer if you've been admitted or not. Us at the, at the college um, graduate office, we just act as a liaison between the graduate school and the individual graduate offices. So that's how your application works. You apply to the graduate school, the graduate school sends your application to the individual program you want to apply to. And the, the, the admissions committee for the program reviews, reviews it. When I mean admission committee, that means um, I'm talking about the um, faculty and professor in your program. For instance, if you're interested in um, agricultural engineering, there are faculties in agricultural engineering who are going to review your applications and then send your dec the decisions to the graduate school. The graduate school then sends you your offer. I hope that makes sense. So if you have any inquiries regarding um, your graduate school application or which school you have to send it to, definitely email us and we can direct you to that. Um, Jackie would also help um, post this link on the chat as well. Thank you. So I'm talking about the graduate school application and the process. Yes, it gets to the graduate school. So what parts, what are the parts of the application? One thing you should know is that um, the application process, it's, it's a marathon, right? You don't do it once. It, it takes time. It takes a lot of resources, just like you prepare for your courses and your research work. Um, the application process requires that dedication as well. There are a whole lot of parts of the application. It doesn't just get um, decisions and made just because of one part of the application. It is made holistically based on a number of different parts. Um, and these different parts are the parts that you should take note of when you're applying, puts in all your best in each part of it. First is the online application form and fee. It is, uh, it costs about $75 for Purdue to apply to Purdue University to get the application form. However, you should know that there are application fee waivers. Um, there are some things you can do to get free application. You don't need to pay the application fee. And I'll tell you a little more about it during the course of this presentation. So the first part is the application form. You need to fill that out. And the second part is the statement of purpose. Um, you might, I guess most of you already know what a statement of purpose is. So a statement of purpose is basically a statement of why you're coming to grad school. Why do you want to come to Purdue University? Why do you think Purdue University is the best fit for you? Why are you not going to work? Why do you think you need to leave your undergrad to come to graduate school to get um, more education? This is where you talk about this. You talk about your motivation, um, what you plan to do at Purdue University, how you've been prepared for this, um, um, how this degree would help your career on the long term. So you want to discuss how this, it's usually between 300 and 500 words. So you need to put your, your details, information about yourself or why you want to go to grad school, what's motivating you, what program you want to go into, what kind of research you want to do. If you have faculty, you already want to work to. You want to mention, you want to mention all that in your statement of purpose and keep it concise. Don't, don't put in a lot of irrelevant details. Put in details that talk about your interests and your goals and what your skills are and how they tie to your, your long-term goal after graduate school. That's what you want to talk about in your statement of purpose. Then is the letter of recommendation. Typically uh, for programs at the College of Engineering, you require about three letters of recommendation from professors. So you need to have 
strong recommendation letters. I'm going to emphasize the strong. So your letter of recommendation has to be strong. It has to be detailed about you, um, um, what you bring to the table. It has to be able to talk about your skill sets, how you're prepared for graduate school, well, what the person has seen in you that makes the person think you're a good fit for a graduate program and how motivated you are. So you need to have someone or professor who's willing to talk about these things and give the person time, right? If you're applying by December, you need to start talking to the person now. Okay, um, Professor Dus, I am interested in apply to this, applying to this graduate program. These are the skills I think I have and I can bring to the table. You, you attach your resume and like, okay, I have been doing this and that. And this has prepared me for this particular degree. And I will appreciate if you can help me write a recommendation letter. So you don't want a paragraph length of a recommendation letter. You want one that totally describes your skill and what, how you're good or you're perfect for the role you want to apply to. Also, if you're thinking about applying to a PhD, you have to be sure that your application, I mean, your letter of recommendation is from someone who already has a PhD because you don't want to be applying for a PhD and then you don't have anybody, I mean, you don't have anybody recommending you who is from a PhD. This is because someone who already has a PhD knows what it is like to do a PhD. So they will be able to talk more about your skills and how you're fit for a degree in graduate school. So the next part is the standardized test course. That's the graduate record examination, the GRE. So some programs are waiving this requirements. So you need to check um, for the program you're applying to, check if they're requiring the GRE for the session you wanna get in. Sometimes it is not clearly stated that, okay, we're not accepting GRE for this year. Sometimes you have to mail the graduate coordinator and inquire, okay, do I need a GRE to apply for this program? So. If you want to find out this information, always reach out to the graduate coordinator of the program. So you want to get um, the grades, get the minimum requirements of each program set. Next thing is the TOEFL and the IELTS. So you need to have your um, test of English proficiency test um, taken early. So you have that as part of your application. It is required for every program for countries that are non-English speaking to have the TOEFL or IELTS. test. So this, this is the test you need to take. Also, um, next thing is your GPA. A part of your GPA is you have to keep your GPA high. Um, at Purdue University, we have use a scale of 4.0. So if your scale is in 4.0, you need to convert your GPA to a 4.0 scale. To do that, you either reach out to your school or you use an online evaluation tool, that's the West evaluation tool or something like that. Yeah, you convert your GPA to a 4.0 GPA scale. The minimum requirements for admission at Purdue University is 3.0 out of four. So you have to keep your GPA above 3.0 to get to be considered for admission at Purdue University. Next part is your academic transcripts. You need to get that ready when you are about to apply to graduate school and get that submitted. And then your previous work experience, research experience and activities, these are all parts of your application that are going to be considered. These parts are the parts you're going to mention in your statement of purpose. Okay, I have this work experience, this research experience, I've done this, and this has prepared me for graduate school. So these are some of the things you need to mention in your statement of purpose and include them in your CV or resume. So, all these are parts of your applications that make um, a strong application. So your application isn't just considered based on your statement of purpose or just your letter of recommendation. It takes every part of it. So either you're strong in this or weak in that, but you have to make sure that you are strong in every part of this um, list. For more information about um, all those parts of the application, you can check out this website. Um, which is going to be posted in chat for you. So um, check it out. If you require any more information, feel free to email us and um, we'll get back to you on it. So about the timeline of the application. Yeah, you, you, you have to apply your application earlier on. You have to send in your application early. Um, the deadlines and requirements for each program, 
varies. Um, for most entry periods, it's usually four, and that starts in August. For instance, if you're thinking about resuming in um, fall next year, that is fall 2023, so you need to apply by December 2022. So your applications are usually sent in a year before you plan to resume. So if you're resuming August 2020, Three, you need to send in your application by December 2022. So the deadlines actually vary program by program, but mostly it's around December and August is a start period. So how do you do this? Between September and October, you need to be drafting your essays as your statement of purpose. And if you have diversity essays to, to write, you need to like start writing that between September and October. And if you're taking standardized tests, you should be taking that between this period and asking your professors for letters of recommendation should be done in this period. And between November and December, you have to make sure that all your application pieces have been sent in. Your faculties are being emailed. Um, you have to like tell them, okay, I'm interested in working with you. Um, what is it like working in your lab? Things like that. So you need to get that done between November and December. So when did the deadline close closes? Um, your offer for admission usually should come between um, January and March. So you should start getting um, response regarding your application if you've been successful or not between January and March. And then you'll be required to make a decision if you're going to accept the admission or not by April 15th. That's the, um, the date where you have to like get your application all sent. I mean, your offer sent back to the university. So start here and go anywhere. Like I mentioned, our alumni go to do amazing things. So once you come to Purdue University, definitely be sure you're going to do great things when you get out of Purdue. Trust me, I am in Purdue University and I've seen a number of people, a number of friends graduate from Purdue University and go do amazing things, work in industry, or become postdocs, do research, or things like that. So Purdue University is basically a license for you to do amazing things. Once you get in, you get out with something remarkable. So after today, um, I talked about um, ways you can get the application fee waivers, so, so you won't have to pay the $75 fee. One of that is to attend our virtual graduate showcase. It is an event which is held annually. This year's event is on the September on the 25th, between the 25th and 26th of September. So um, things to expect at this program are we have workshops and program information sessions where you get to know about the different programs we have. There are representatives there to talk to you about the programs and how you can apply. And then you get to meet faculty and current grad students to understand, okay, I am coming to this program. I don't know anything about it, but I want to learn more about it. So you get to meet people like that. You get to meet current grad students who are already doing things that you hope to do and they get to present their posters. So we have poster presentation sessions about their research, what they're currently working on, if you like it. So things like that and many more are things you should expect at this gradual graduate showcase program. So it is fully online. You don't need to be a Purdue to do it. You can attend virtually from the comfort of your home and the registration is free. Application fee waivers also exist after you've attended this event. So definitely take advantage of this program and attend. So to register, you can join our mailing list on this website, which Jackie would um, post on the chat for you. So definitely plan to attend this event. Uh, it is a way for you to get the application fee waiver. You don't need to pay the $75 um, application fee after you attend this event. So I have a number of things that I would expect you to do after this presentation, after today. First is to watch a student video. Uh, there's a Brazilian student video talking about um, the experience of Brazilian students at Purdue. So you want to find out about um, how it's like at Purdue, how it's going, or what it's like at Purdue. So you should watch that video. Also, you should visit our website. Um, Purdue Engineering Grad Program. All those websites will be posted in a chat for you to check. And I think I can send this slide as well. So you can have this to go through yourself. And then look under uh, prospective students events on our website. 
this way you get to see other seminars uh, webinars we have and some of these webinars you get to get um, the application fee waivers one thing you should know is that the application fee waivers last between two to three years so if you don't get to use it this year you can still use it next year also you can subscribe to our youtube channel and you get to watch more videos about graduate school application how to go about funding and things like that Subsequently, you should think about emailing faculty of interest. Since you've checked the program you're interested in, you want to check out faculty you might be interested in doing research with or working with for your graduate program. So these are basically five things I expect you like to do after this presentation. So definitely come join us. We're waiting for you. Purdue, Purdue University is really amazing. I can tell for myself because I resume at Purdue. Um, last semester spring in january and it has been an amazing experience the faculty are really amazing and the grad students are really cool people um uh, i i joined the community of nigerians community of underrepresented minority it is really awesome to be at purdue and besides the learning the research the people are amazing so definitely come join us and Feel free to reach out to me on my email um, here, lrnzi.edu, and Dr. Jackie McDermott as well. Our email is attached. And also, you can email us at engineeringgrad.purdue.edu. So, definitely feel free to reach out, and we're expecting you at Purdue. Thank you so much. So I'll take questions, comments. Thank you. Thank you, Lexi. You, they, you did an amazing job. This is wonderful. Very clear. It's so good to see someone that went through the exact mm -hmm. process that the students are going through right now, right? So congratulations for your journey you. until Thank here. You, you were you. very convincing. Let <laughs> Purdue to have you. You were a wonderful representative of international <laughs> students, not to say from Nigeria as well. So Thank you. Very good job. So we are open for questions, right? I don't know if we have any here, not on the chat, but yes, Alini has a question. Is that okay if they open the mics, Lexi? I think it would be more informal, right? Yes. Or, and then we have one in writing here too. So how about if we open Alini? Can you open your mic and ask your question? Then we have one. Can you hear me? Yes, sure. Go yes. Ahead. So, hello. Uh, I have a question about uh, contacting faculty. Uh, Lexi uh, said we should contact if faculty we are interest, we're interested. So, I already found a professor I'm interested in her research at Purdue. Mm -hmm. I sent her an email. But I am afraid she didn't get it or she didn't have the time to answer it yet. I was just afraid, for example, if the professor does not answer the email and I can uh, I I don't get the chance to talk to a faculty, should I apply to the program anyway? Yes, so um First thing, like I mentioned earlier, some programs don't require you to talk to faculty to get funded. So you need to be sure that is the case. Also, it is it is pretty normal for faculty not to respond to your email. I've been there. I, I knew when I was applying to Purdue, I sent out emails to and they didn't respond. So it's normal. They're usually so busy, they don't get time to reply to email. So what you do when you send an email and you don't get a response? Sometimes you send a follow-up email. Okay, I sent this email. Um, I am afraid I might have sent that wrong or least convenient time. Would you take a little time to look at my email? Send that out again to get a feedback. And yeah, you might get a feedback from that. You might not. So look out for other faculty as well. Don't, don't streamline yourself to a particular faculty. If that faculty doesn't work for you, try out another faculty that could work. Also about applying to the graduate program. Of course, definitely apply to the graduate program. Like I said, it is not um, always um, one streamline to um, receive funding, right? There are internal and external funding opportunities. So if you don't get funded by um, a faculty, there are other avenues. Currently, I am not exactly funded by a faculty. Yeah, I'm fully funded, I'm funded by the um, College of Engineering because I applied separately for the funding. So 
you need to find different avenues. So definitely, if you're interested in a program, apply, even if you don't get a faculty. Thank you. We have the next question is from Flavia. Flavia, I know you were there and I don't think it's okay. How about if you ask your question directly? It has to do with the previous question, right? Yes. Uh, hello. So uh, I had contact a professor from the Department of Biomedical Engineering. Okay. And I contact uh, her three times. <laughs> she did answer me. So uh, I'm thinking because I'm a master, uh, I'm a master prospective student. So I'm a little worried about funding and get funding from a, from the factory. So in this case, what should I do? I do because uh, I know a master student they may uh, require uh, funding from the factory. So. You need to be uh, in contact or, or with some professor. Yes. So for masters, like I said, um, funding isn't quite so easy for master students, right? Um, it's it's cool to have a faculty willing to work in work with you to get funded. And since you've contacted her, contacted her several times and she hasn't replied, so yeah, you might have to look out for other faculties, like I said, right? Um, try to like check other faculties that might be in tune to what you're interested in working with. Email them, and definitely, it doesn't mean you shouldn't apply because um, faculties are not responding. Sometimes they tend to respond to you after your application has gotten in, right? So apply and then keep emailing faculty, right? Keep your emails short. Don't try to like blast emails to different faculties at once. Tailor your email to the kind of research they're doing and what you're interested in doing, and then just apply. And if you do not get funded by your faculty, there are other research, I mean, funding opportunities you can look out for. I mean, there are a lot of mem websites and links we send to you. Check some of them out. Those are external funding opportunities you can apply for outside your normal um, application, right? So if you do not get funded by faculty, don't get scared. There are other opportunities for you to apply to. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. I yeah. have another yeah. question. Uh, okay. Can I mention her name in, in my SOP, even if she didn't answer me? Awesome. Okay. Definitely do that. Okay. And okay. Uh, can I mention, oh, like one more professor? Just in yes. Case? Yes. Just mention maximum of two, right? Keep it two. Okay. Two people. Give us a two, two people you'll be interested in working with. But if you have one particular person you're so excited, definitely mention them. Okay. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Yeah, and, and I'll quickly chime in and say it, it, it's sometimes you won't receive emails from faculty when you um, send them before your application. But once you apply, what you can do is you can follow up on that same email thread and say, hey, faculty X, I've submitted my graduate application. It's in the system. You can go look at it because sometimes they want to look at transcripts and like they want to like know that you're serious. So you can say, hey, it's it's submitted like please let me know if you want to schedule a Zoom call or, or to chat about your research so you can get a better feel for that. Um, but the majority of funding does go to PhD students, especially in um, um, our engineering disciplines. Um, although master students do get funded, if you can talk about what you wanna do after your master's and you say, hey, I'm interested in getting my master's degree. And then if you are interested in going on for a PhD after, then say that, right? Um, that can be really helpful and powerful um, if you're interested in moving into industry. It's sometimes also helpful context. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah. And Heidi added some tips here on, on the chat too. Please keep reading the chat, okay? So this is one thing we always remind you about that you should read about the professor you were reaching out. Get to know what his work or her work the research topics and I'll have some content to share with it, him or her, right? So this is very important. Um, Haisa has a question. Do you want to read it out loud, Haisa? Please. Yeah, um, 
Thank you for this presentation. And uh, my first question was about contacting faculty. And I think I got the answer here. And I have another question. Uh, so is there residential grad school housing in Purdue? And if not, does the university assist students with finding housing or uh, roommate matching? Right, so um, <clears throat> for, for housing, most times graduate students usually sort out their accommodation themselves. Um, housing is usually mostly provided for undergraduate students. There are all, however, housing for um, graduate students with family, housing like that um, um, exists. But the Purdue University provides um, avenues for grad students to have um, housing, campus, off-campus housing. There's a website for that. So you get to like use the website to check for housing outside Purdue University. It's on the website on Purdue. So you get to sort out yourself. They expect you like to figure out your accommodation, but they provide links for um, valid um, accommodation opportunities for you to like apply to and get that. I use an external housing um, um, agency myself. So that works and it's an easy process. You get the housing sorted out if you want roommates or you don't want roommates or you want to live alone in studio apartments. That's totally up to you. Nobody's going to like, oh, you have to live here or that. It's up to you. So it's pretty like up to you. Thank you. Yeah. Very good. Anything else? Any other questions? Okay, Samuel, please go ahead. Yep. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, my name is Samuel. Um, I'm planning to apply for a PhD in continuing. Uh, my question would be regarding um, letters of recommendations. Um, I could okay. see that the mechanical engineering department, um, they required three letters of recommendation. And I was wondering if I can have more than three um is it possible can, can i have more than than like yeah maybe an additional yes something like this? of course you can have more than three right but if you're going to have more than three you have to make sure they are really strong letters of recommendation you don't want to have like for really scanty letter of recommendation are really they don't speak to your skills or what you're capable of doing so that's why three is good like three stronger letters of recommendation that speak to your skills. But if you can get four strong letters of recommendation, by all means, you can have that as well. But the key thing is have strong ones, the ones that really speak to your skills. Thank you very much. Yeah. No okay, any Anything else? We are exactly within an hour of presentation. And I'm very impressed with you again, Lexi. Thank you so much for you. You had such a thorough presentation and we can see that you went through the process. You know the topics that are really the main concerns of the students, international students, right? Yeah. I'm so glad to hear that you went through education, you would say, in Nigeria. Yeah. So, yeah. yay, we have a global <laughs> network we are so proud of. And yeah. so this is very special for us. It's very special to have Heidi here because she's such a big supporter of education, you would say, everywhere. And Jackie, thank you so much for being here with us as well, sending all the links. Mm -hmm. We'll make sure all the students have access to that. And, and yes, I see here a final comment about uh, faculty that are the ones that should be preparing your letters of recommendation, right? And faculty will be reading your letters. So yes be concise and, and be able to articulate your academic strengths there, right? It's not just the obvious, you are a wonderful student as we make jokes in Brazil, right? No, but they don't need to know that. They need to know why you are outstanding, why you are applying for the program, right? So thank you so much for all this wonderful audience, for the questions and let's see, we will reach out for you if we have more questions. A stay yeah. in touch. Perhaps Definitely. one day you come to Brazil, visit us. <laughs> you never <Sure>. know. <laughs> of course. Yeah.
Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So have a wonderful Friday and a wonderful weekend. And see you next week. Take care. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. 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 Wonderful weekend. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Thank you.